untethered magic. <laughs> and what it is? It's untethered. <laughs> um, it's a sanctuary, in a sort, for myself. It started that way. It'll continue to be that. Um, I think it's a home. It's not like an institution. It's not designed to be an institution. So in one way, I've grown a lot. In, in maybe 10 years ago, I was still thinking very institutionally. To practice, I do work that's difficult for people to live with. Um, about identity, about history, about racism, about power structures, stuff you don't want to look at, especially in a society where the gaps of wealth are so huge, uh, the racism is very strong, um, people are consistently undermined, uh, there's a lot of kind of so psychological violence o over generations, so it's not stuff you want to live with. Um, so in order to make the work I wanted to make, I always, um, I decided to teach part time so I could fund my own practice. So I wasn't, I did, wasn't in a position that most artists find themselves in where they have to compromise a lot and make work that's sellable in a market that's wants a specific kind of idea of what African art is or Kenyan art is um, in order to feed themselves. I wanted to get away from that uh, cycle and buying land was a big part of that because with that I have even more independence. Um, I don't have to worry about uh, rent money. To get out of that system of dependency where then I compromise the work in order to survive. That was really the, the core key of it. And when I was looking for land, uh, this area was like cheaper than the rest of Nairobi. And um, at the time, only 8% of uh, people in the city owned land, which is insane. So you have these massive um, few families who own copious amounts of property, and that's it. <laughs> it's crazy. And um, when you arrive here, and, uh, and you, you, you told me that you started with your studio, yeah. Uh, when you expand uh, the, the space with other people, do you design um, each part of the space or it was designed because the people arrived and because what they are doing and who they were? Okay, yeah, no. So it was always designed in a way of um, the traditional way of separate structures for different activities. Um, I don't know if Bomas normally have like a horseshoe or a circular design. Not the, the buildings are not traditional in any sense. Um, and I, oh, I knew I wanted that kind of design because it facilitates being able to be with many people without feeling like you're on top of each other. And there's something about the inside outside living. You're not indoors completely, you're not outdoors completely. It's an in-between space. So that thing of untethered or fluid is constant. And the studio I bought, years ago, this studio that we're sitting in, it's, you can take it apart and put fit it in a truck. So when I was buying the studio, I was actually thinking, I was working, I had a son, I still have a son of course, he's uh, at the time 2011, born in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, he's 4, 5. So I was like, am I going to go to work, then go to a studio and then come home? That's ridiculous. So I got a studio that was mobile, that I could put in the property I was in, knowing I could move it. But the thing with me is wherever the studio goes, that's really now my anchor. The studio's always been the anchor. And the structures around, I mean, we just, you make do. It wasn't designed for others. It's just designed for what is needed. And that is my needs, other people's needs, but they are aligning in a sense. I don't know if that's making sense for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about uh, the member of the space at the moment? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, it's funny, I, so what, how it originally started was that I was, I travel a lot and um, there's a woman who called me, um, her name is Wakianda, in fact she's coming on Saturday, you'll meet her, um, she's a fashion designer, I didn't know her, uh, Neil, my neighbor, uh, knew her vaguely, 
and said um, she's having a you know a blockage. She doesn't know what to create. She wants to move out of the city just to get on her feet and get back into creative making. So I met her the day I was leaving, and I said, "Look, you want the space? Take care of my plants here. The peas by." And she was stunned. She was like, "You don't know me." And I said, "It's okay. I've met you, and I can feel you, and that's enough." And she started making, and then um, I came back. We spent two, three weeks together, and she introduced me to Kibera, who just came to visit because they're friends. Then another artist from Western Kenya called Nico Mambo was going to art school in Hamburg. Um, he really wanted to see Nairobi, um, infiltrate Nairobi more. We exhibited together, that's how we met, in Alliance Francaise in December 2018. And um, he, he just wanted a space to be in without having to... Um, without having to kind of spend so much money because it's a difficult city to live in. It's not, it's, not, it's not a cheap city. Transport is not so cheap and renting is not cheap. So I told him, look, I'm traveling again. Same story like Wakianda, stay. And then Wakianda called me and was like, eh, my friends just lost their place where they can live. Uh, I know you, you're traveling. I know Nikomambo was supposed to come. Is it possible? So I asked Nikomambo, I know you wanted to be here alone. Do you mind having company? He said, no, cool. So I left and the three of them were here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I left because when I came back they had a dishwashing routine um, in place which was nice because I was like oh am I going to be the mother hen who's going to be like we have to wash dishes we have to do this and because I was away they self-organized and I think um, that's something I learned to let people self-organize rather than you know I have, I'm a mom so I have this thing of like okay, we have to do this, we have to do that. And I think, oh, young boys, they're all not going to clean, they're all not going to, you know, and I'll be the mother. And it's not true. Because I was away, they had to self-organize. And uh, I just fit it back into their system. So the dish rotation, I was like, okay, wh which is my slot? And that's how it's been ever since. Um, and in the beginning, this was in June, I think, June, July. Yeah. And uh, Kiba and Kiba, Kiba Eru brought his friend Kiba, who I didn't even know was going to be there. And Kiba was like tiptoeing around. He's like, oh, oh, am I going to be told to leave? You know what? <laughs> and uh, uh, it was just like, it was easy. Um, and I had told Kiba, look, I don't have a studio assistant. I need a studio assistant. I don't have enough of a regular income to manage to employ you full time. And we also don't know if we like to work together. Why don't we see what it's like? When I'm here, we work together. When I'm gone, you do your own thing. Uh, and he said, yeah, that's cool, let's try it out. We really liked working together. I said, look, if this works, then when I bring in projects that have their own funding, they employ you as an assistant. And let's see if that can work. And that's how now with Kadasar, it slowly started. Kadasar is the first group um, that's like a more uh, official partnership with an institution. But again, they've really wanted to support so when I, when I first met Chris and Dalida as a, as a fellow in 2018, I was saying, you know, I want my space to be a place for people to come to. Because the thing about the city and about the art scene here is it's so commercial and it's moving in a very commercial direction that there are no spaces for process or for just to think or just to be without having to make in a specific way. And the history of our NGO models is always like they have a set agenda for what is expected. So people can't explore themselves. Uh, there's not a lot of critical dialogue. So guys don't have a space to like discuss things in a safe way, where it's not an external funder or a Western funder with their Western agenda to say, this is what you guys should be doing. Or now we're interested in LGBTQ things, so we'll only fund that. Um, so, and they were interested in, in saying like, okay, how can we support this? Even though I wasn't willing to write a, a thing of what this is. Even the name Untethered Magic came through Kibe and Kiberu. Uh, they named the internet that, that, and I was like, that's a cool name. And it's like, and actually, it, and I, I am, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a magician, I'm not magic, but I'm a bit of a witch. <laughs> In a good, a good witch. I can sense people, I can sense if they're coming with a good intention or bad intention, and somehow we've just attracted really good, good, good people. And from your experience, because I suppose you did a lot of residencies before. Yeah. Uh, first of first of all, I would like to know what 
what was your mindset with those we didn't see yeah. if something that um, fulfill what you expected at the beginning and uh, also from your experience do you know other places where you have a sanctuary as a residency because I see this pa this place as a space where people from outside are meeting artists working here so it's not just coming and just doing things in that space the space already have an identity a life people so it's a uh, people meet to build something yeah um, that's a super question because I was quite strategic with without being conscious about it for some reason I guess because of my practice I was invited to residencies or uh, told by people to apply to residencies that are not interested in production so I had a really interesting history with the residencies that I've been to so I've been to Iaspis which is in Sweden which is um, like a fully funded residency um, where you don't have to produce a product. That was actually the first time I was in that kind of residency and it took me two weeks to just uh, unwind from the idea of you have to produce something or what is it that the other person wants. And also because I was in a teaching system, institution work-wise, it was also teaching does that to you. It makes you like, okay, there's a end product, there's a plan, there's a schedule, there's then a product. Um, the other residency was Delfina Foundation, which is also not interested in a final end product. But obviously when you're in that situation, you end up doing honest work. Uh, you end up researching things you're genuinely interested in, you yourself, and you get super productive because you are kind of in a sense so grateful for not having to produce in that sense, that you actually work really hard and you're working on things you're genuinely interested in. And that thread keeps continuing. And the other one was HIAP, which is in Finland. Um, and there, there it's, it was a new shift to be invited into residencies that are also uh, paying you, um, uh, not a stipend, but like actually, so Finland and HIAP, uh, I was with the art, un uh, art University and they actually paid a fee for me to be there, which meant that the, there's a shift between residencies where you're just, you're not having to spend any money, but you're not making any money. And if you're, you have bills to pay, I mean, bills don't go away. So yes, you have a break and that works for maybe younger people or works for people who don't have a rent situation or a studio they have to rent out or employees they have. But as time goes on, those needs are there and aren't met. So slowly I've started entering for some reason into residency spaces that actually pay you to be there, which makes even more sense because you bills don't go away. So I'm often encouraging artists to find spaces that, that support you fully, even to the point where you're not spending anything and you can make a body of work that you can carry away with you. Or a residence, better residencies, even the ones that actually give you a stipend that you can take. And also, you, you have to be smart. I mean, I would get a per diem and eat shit. I'd eat ramen noodles so that I'd have the, uh, money in my pocket at the end of the day. You have to be a bit, you know, and like, I, you know, some artists would go and drink it all on champagne. And I'm like, fuck that shit. I want to build, I want to build my, I want to buy land. I want to build, I want to get independent and autonomous. Uh, I got two last question. Um, when I arrived uh, last Saturday, um, we were really specific about the fact that um, the idea of the project of the space and what you have in mind, it's not to go to do promotion of the space, but you want people to come and uh, understand the space. Um, why? Uh, I just think it's more honest. <laughs> I think... Um, I think the other thing is institutional thinking. I think the other thing is not a home. Um, I think it's not an honest exchange if it's about the space. Of course, in a sense, the space facilitates being together. But if you start to get into the mode of um, PR machinery, or if I start to look for people, and I'm inviting people because I've come to you, that's a completely different negotiation than if you've, you've heard about the space and you've heard it's available and you want some time out or you want to create something or you want a different dialogue and you're coming 
that's a very different negotiation between us than if I've come to you and if I've come to you then there's a mode of expectation and if you've come to me and the space is open for just making or being or sleeping then that's completely different I don't know if that makes sense for you yeah um, <laughs> and somehow that's worked better for me so the, that space is a uh, it's a, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, it's also modular. Uh, the kitchen wasn't the kitchen uh, a week ago. Oh. Um, <laughs> even though it's not uh, intended, uh, uh, your studio is the soul of the space, even though you didn't choose it. Because when, as you explained to me, uh, when people, they, they, they are here without you, you're still here physically with because of the studio. Um, how we what other part of the uh, body you would want to make exist here uh body like buildings or yeah what, uh, body anything? like uh, if you are the soul what do you think that space that land uh, will need uh to thrive oh gosh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i think um we uh, we really want to make a garden like a vegetable garden uh, we really want to have solar panels. So one thing is to get even more off the grid of dependency. Um, and yes, when I'm gone and you're in my studio studio, the building we're sitting in, or the structure we're sitting in, of my writing is everywhere, but other people's writing is also there. And it's a philosophy or a way of thought. And I don't even know how to concretize that way of thought. But it's supposed to exist without me that would be my ideal I've been kind of writing my will because of uh, lots of reasons <laughs> but um, in my will I have three people who are in charge of continuing the space as a residency it, um, and kind of the land in front will belong to my family but this space should should continue with or without me as long as it's not becoming an institution <laughs> <laughs> as long as it stays a home. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Crazy, no? <laughs>